I saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the view of Wolfpack Research or any of its officers. The views and opinions expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on this program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. We are not investment advisors. We hold no registrations with the SEC, FINRA, or any other regulatory agency, and none of the opinions expressed on this podcast should be considered investment advice. The listener should assume that we have positions in and stand to benefit from any stock or other security mentioned on this podcast. Do your own research before making investment decisions. All right, welcome to the Wolf Den. This is Dan David. I'm here with the pack, our usual suspects today. We have Tick, our producer, and Carl, our sound engineer. God help us all. Uh, we have a great guest today. I'm very excited to talk to Herb Greenberg. Herb has been a business reporter, oh, I'll say for a while, uh, as long as I've been paying attention to business anyway. He's done some pretty famous and prolific stuff, although he's kind of modest about it. We'll drag it out of him anyway. I became aware of Herb as a contributor to CNBC. He was on there almost every day when I was paying attention back in 2011 and before. He now is a partner at Pacific Square Research. And uh, I've read some of his research, and it's just it's phenomenal. It's short side research, really good stuff, the kind of stuff that investment banks aren't doing. Welcome to the show, Herb. Hi, Dan. I'm glad to be here. So, Herb, you know, you, you've done a few of these things and you're you're just maybe one of my most well-known guests. And there's a lot of stuff out there people can talk about uh, that, that you've done. But I kind of want to get to some of the stuff that some of the rich detail stories that you might have in the trenches uh, dating back when. I know of you, as I said, starting with you know, the 2010-2011 China RTO crisis, you were pretty much one of the only guys on CNBC willing to talk about this in any kind of detail, uh, but you had a rich career before that. So before we get into that time period, why don't you tell us about how you started and how, how things have changed maybe since you've started reporting and being a business journalist? Yeah, this, you know, I go way back. Uh, my first job out of school was in 1974 at the then Boca Raton News, where I, by default, became the business journalist there, the business reporter there. Uh, what do you mean by default? I, I was I was wondering if you're going to ask that. <laughs> by default, because back then, you have to understand, they had a Sunday, they had a Sunday edition, a weekend edition. And that was in the Watergate era, the post Watergate era. Right. And that was in the era when nobody wanted to be a business reporter. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't start out wanting to be a journalist or a business reporter. I had no business background. You know, it's all these things you fall into, you know, through yeah. school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the kind of thing where they'd circulate the business reporter job. You know, who's going to do the business page every week? And nobody wanted to do it. You know, everybody would rather be covering city council or whatever the case was. So I said, I, I'll do it. And I went out and I did some, I'll never forget the first business story I did was a story about a manager at the local Publix and how a manager, at, how you could go to Publix and start, you know, be a bagger. And you could end up going and becoming a manager. And at Publix in those days, it was actually a pretty good job. I'm sure it still sure is. There's a lot of profit sharing. Uh, and it was, uh, it was just a good story. So I started doing those little thumb suckers, uh, you know, and, and wanting to do them and going out and starting to interview, you know, you forget Boca Raton is where a lot of very wealthy, successful people had retired. And I just sort of, you know, started building interviews and doing interviews like Lee Iacocca was down there. He used to be, you know, that he was the- well, When did you interview Lee Iacocca? Back in 1974, 75. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, when he, yeah, and it was, it was a scary interview because, yeah. you know, you do your research, I came with a tape recorder. Sure. We had the interview in a conference room at the Boca Raton Hotel and Club. I know nothing about the guy. And he struts in with his PR guy and he's a big guy and he sits down and the first thing they say is no tape recorder. And it's like, my, oh no, what am I gonna do? And now I've got, a, and this guy just talks fast and yeah. he's cursing and I'm like writing on it. And uh, so I did that, you know, I did a lot of those. So I started to do a bunch of interviews down there and people would come to town. I do the, um, you know, go to the conferences that would be there and interview some uh, economist who says there's a 50% chance we're heading toward a, uh, a, a depression equal to or worse than 
the 1929 crash. And of course, 50% chance. And I'm just a young reporter and I'm writing it down saying, oh man, he said a 50% chance. So I just started doing that kind of thing. And then, um, well, I, I would say Boca Raton now is where penny stock frauds go to retire. That's right. I, I got to <laughs> Well, let me tell you, there's a, there's a funny story because among the, among the, the, again, I call them thumb suckers we, that I did back then. These are the, the stories you just do their featurettes. They're for the business page. One of the stories, and this is a precursor to the penny stock frauds, even though it was nowhere near penny stock, but it shows the type of things that were going on. It shows how gullible I was. I probably still am. But there was a there was a story I did about a guy who um, he's a former cop. And the story was he had this white powder that was this miracle powder. And he was going to be selling this powder that was sort of like baking, baking powder, their baking soda that you could put in your in your refrigerator or do whatever you wanted. And it was this miracle stuff. And I wrote this story about this guy and his wife, blah, blah, blah. It was, is, this was a positive story. This is a, of course I only did positive. Stories. So you, you, you actually thought this guy had ma- magic baking soda. Hey, I had to write a story. I had to write something once a week. It was a, there was a business component <laughs> to it. All right. So it turns out you've gotten skeptical since then. A little skeptical. Yeah. Now. So the, the, uh, so it turns out, a number of years later, he was arrested because in those barrels, he was he was a gun stealer, he's an arms dealer. Uh-huh. And he was sort of he was, he was one importing is. arms. Or, so, you know, it's one of those things where I was sort of like putting this helping put this facade on this, uh, you know, this guy who was really using those that white. Oh, powder well, dairy. look, I mean, you know, you were your cub reporter in the in the business section. Nobody wanted. And the way I see it, you shed some light on a criminal that started down the path of bringing him to justice. How's that? Yeah. And it actually started teaching me, look, I learned a lot back then. And, and I learned a lot about journalism. And it's funny, you learn little things. And if you say, well, what did you really learn from all the people you interviewed and everything? I'll tell you what I learned. I learned that one thing about journalism, and I even carried through to today, to the research business, is you never can, you have to be careful when you write. And you never... Uh, know how people react to things where you're adding value in this world I live in today. You never know exactly where you're going to add value because little tidbits end up being valuable. Something somebody doesn't care about will be valuable. And that's why even when people put stuff on social media, people write things and they don't realize the little thing you say can be misconstrued. Yeah. And that's why sometimes you, you know painstakingly work on words and sentences to sort of get it right. Well, you learned that lesson early and, and you still think about it today. I do. And then I, you know, I, I just started moving through journalism. I stayed there for a short amount of time. I went to a trade publication after that um, that uh, covered the circuses, fairs, carnival, auditory marina industry. How did you get into the business world? Well, into the real business world is I was looking uh, to get out of the trade publication uh, after about a year and six state fairs. And and I actually wanted to, to work at a circus for a summer, but I was offered my job in, in Boca Raton instead. I um I actually uh, then got a little more serious and I went to work. I got hired at the uh, the St. Paul Pioneer Press. It was owned by Knight Ritter. Knight Ritter mm-hmm. is the organization yeah. that owned that owned in those days. Yeah, um, a lot. It was the Knight Ritter newspaper chain, which you you probably know. Yeah. and mm-hmm. and it was it also owned the Boca Raton News at the time. It was a good I short at one to, time. It was a good short at one time, right? It was it was as were all newspaper stocks. Yeah. And I was a, um, uh, I had gone to college on a scholarship. I'd gone to the University of Miami on a scholarship from um, the Miami Herald uh, that I got when I was at Miami Dade Community College um, to finish my last years. And it was on a scholarship from Miami Herald. So I had this Knight Ritter connection. Plus, I was raised in, in Miami. So I wanted to go back to Knight Ritter. I liked Knight Ritter and I interviewed around. Did not get hired in Detroit, thankfully. I actually did. Did hey, uh, I know you're from Michigan? Hey, yeah, hey, I, 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 I let the Miami I, thing go. D- don't even be <laughs> crap on Detroit, pal. We got enough problems. I almost no. They. I did not. Thankfully, I didn't get hired there because it would have been the wrong connection. I would have been on the city side. I was not set up for that. But I got hired in St. Paul, and it was a great opportunity because in yeah. those days, in 1977, St. Paul was a mini Chicago. And you got to really start covering things there. And I really was able to get in. And again, I wasn't as critical as I was, as I was, and as I became, but I went to St. Paul and started to learn because I was starting to interview, you know, we had retail, I had the railroads, I had the airlines, I was covering the, I was covering these beats Mm -hmm. and you're starting to really get a feel for things. And you, you know, you're again, 
you're just doing basic reporting. Um, but it was to set the stage for when I went to Chicago three years later to Crane Chicago Business. And Crane's was a very aggressive publication. It was a weekly. And I, as a, as a reporter for a weekly with a very tough managing editor who really uh, challenged me, ran me through my paces, didn't let me get away with anything. And I think made me, I call it the boot camp of my career, uh, really, um, I think, helped me become a better journalist. Uh, this guy's name was Greg David. He went on to be the, uh, the uh, editor of Cranes New York business. But he was very good in the sense of just, he was difficult to work for, but you need that in your career. And, um, and so I stayed at Cranes for about two and a half years. It was really tough. We covered annual meetings of every company. We literally went to the annual meetings. It didn't matter if there were three people there. Of every company, I was covering all sorts of companies and industries and challenging that's where I became far more critical, trying to write stories. They did not want you to write it. This may happen. That may happen. This story. They wanted you to have a point of view. That was point of view journalism. And that where you, where you sort of spin the story forward, have a strong point of view. I remember we were working on a piece. I was working on a big cover story with another reporter on Motorola. And I couldn't come down to Motorola is based in the Chicago area. And I couldn't come down to determining whether this was going to be a bad company that was going to blow up. You know, there were too many twists and turns to it, and he did not want to hear that. And it was really, you had to have a bottom line to these stories. So I used that then to morph over to the Chicago Tribune, where I became a, a business reporter covering the food industry. And, and what, the, what, what years was this? Was Crane and, and the Chicago Tribune? Cranes, Cranes was 1980 yeah. to 1983, roughly. Okay, so that's pre-cell phone Tribune. for Motorola. So. Uh, Free cell phone. I, yeah, so Motorola probably took off from there and then crashed. Um, and then you went uh, uh, to the Tribune, very went famous newspaper Tribune's, in Chicago. Started started covering, um, you know, the food industry, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, I was leaked stuff from one of the famous insider trading rings called uh, this guy, Dennis Levine. Turns out I was on the receiving end of these anonymous phone calls, which is a whole different story, which has been written about, which I've written about, which is... Uh, was kind of interesting, but the Chicago Tribune, of course, was the Chicago Tribune. What's the gist of that story? The I gist mean, of that story? You may have told some of these stories many, many times, but we, okay. you have a whole new audience here that's kind of coming out, you know, post 9-11 or 2008 crash. They want to hear them. So, look, I was I was in Chicago covering the food industry. There are a lot of mergers and acquisitions in those times with companies that no longer exist or that are owned by other companies. And... Um, the, they were becoming, that was a lot of consolidation in that space. And when you work for a place like uh, like the Tribune, you do get a lot of people calling you with information, trying to tip you, tip stories, tip you to stories and things like that. And of course, you have to go out and try to report. You just can't take every tip and just publish it. What is people this like? Think that's what, Blue Horseshoe uh, loves Anacott Steel? Not quite. Okay. But, it, but there was a guy, there was a specific guy who called me on several mergers and acquisitions. One was when, um, American Stores was going to acquire Jewel, which was a chain mm -hmm. in Chicago. American yeah. Stores was in Arizona. This is grocery stores. And the, yeah. And the other was when G.D. Searle was going to be involved in some transaction. I forget what the transaction was. But I was getting these, this very nice guy calling me with these very good information that we were able to confirm. So, for example, with Jewel and American Stores, the guy said, you know, Sam Skaggs from... Jewel met with Wes Christofferson, the CEO, uh, or Sam Skaggs from American Stores met with the CEO of, um, of Jewel in Denver. They had a meeting in Denver. So I called every hotel in Denver. Wow. In those days, you could get the information. And finally, someone said, yeah, he was, I said, I'd like to, you know, find out was, was you know, Wes Christofferson staying here, or Sam Skaggs, whatever I said. And I found the place where they were staying. So I was able to confirm there was a meeting. And that the two guys were meeting and uh, I was able to uh, we cool. publish the stories and I'll never forget one story I published. They halted trading. And I think it was this one. It may have been the Searle story or this. They halted trading of the stock the day I wrote the story. And I, Did you feel powerful? Like beating. No, I felt scared. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Cause I always figure something, you know, you know, you've got it, but you know, the feeling you just thought you just don't know. You're right. So, oh, I do know the feeling, you know, that feeling. If you write, if you're even yeah. doing what you do, if you write it, if you have impact, 
you don't know what's going to follow once there's impact. And Dan Dorfman worked for the uh, Chicago Tribune at the time. He was in the New York office. And he uh, he called my editor saying they're going to say the Tribune was wrong. And I got to know Dan. I was friends with Dan. But he told my editor, and I'm saying, oh, my God, we're about to get sued. And God knows what's going to happen. Well, right. of course, they confirmed the story. And um, long story short, we fast forward. So I've been in the Tribune doing some good stuff. I moved to New York to become the Tribune's New York financial correspondent. This is probably about 1985, 86. And uh, I'm sitting there one day where office was at the Daily News building at 3rd third, uh, third and uh, 42nd. And late in the afternoon, I get this thing. Hey, there's this U.S. attorney is going to have this uh, press conference. You got to go down and, uh, you know, there's some insider trading something. So here I slept down, take the four or five, get downtown. I don't know. U.S. attorney, I think it was Giuliani at the time. I don't know who was the attorney general. So, I mean, it was U.S. attorney. Anyway, so whoever was giving the press conference, I go down there and there's this, I get the, I get the, I get the documents and I'm looking. G.D. Searle, American Stores and Jewel. This guy named, yeah, you know, I go, oh my God, this is, this is where I was getting the stories. And there's a name, but it was for a guy named Robert Wilkes. I'm thinking, Robert Wilkes, who's Robert Wilkes? And so I go back to my office and I call this guy's home. Mm -hmm. And oh my God. It's his voice on the phone, answering the phone. Got and I him. say, I got him. That's who my source was. Because yeah. we never knew. Why would somebody be giving us this? Was it somebody who was mad at the company? You don't know. But if the information's real and you can confirm it, you know, you've got your stories. Mm -hmm. So I, I, then I call back later and it's his daughter's, his daughter's voice on the phone. His voice is no longer on the phone because I called and left a message. Uh -huh. well, they obviously, you know, I said, hey, I think I know you. We need to talk. So then I go back a few weeks later. So when you say so, when you say you, his voice, it was the answering machine. It wasn't him picking up the phone. The, no, it was the answering machine. Okay, okay, I was like, gotcha. Oh my God, I can't believe this is the guy. Okay, um, you know, for for two years, I'm wondering who is this very nice guy. I'm. Talking what was his to? motivation ultimately besides money? <laughs> I'm sure it, it was, was money. It was money. It was one of the great insider trading. It, this was one of the great of the day. This was one of the great insider trading cases. And so the next, a few weeks later, I get the same, you know, late in the day, press conference, suit is being filed. I go down, it's about against a guy named, now they've put together the next person who this guy, Robert Wilkes, was with. Right. This guy named Dennis Levine. And Dennis Levine worked for Drexel Burnham in the day. He was the, he was really the sort of the lead person here. So I, I go, oh my God, this is this big, this is really big. So I go to the arraignment the next day and I get to the court, the court early and there's this woman there and she comes up to me. She wonders if I'm an attorney. It turns out it's Dennis Levine's wife. She was very, very uh, nervous and very. Uh, As a wife should be in that situation. <laughs> and she was, she had no idea what was coming. Yeah. Then he comes in the courtyard courtroom and I walk up to him and I say, you know, I think we've met. Actually, I'm going to reverse this. I think it was Dennis Levine first, Bob Wilk is second. I, that's what it was. It was the Dennis Levine case first. Dennis Levine was the first one. I walk up to him in the arraignment. I say, I think I've, we've met before because this was all the, 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 the GD Searle, the American stores and some other stuff. And he says, I don't think so. And it wasn't his voice. It was the next few weeks later when the Robert Wilkes came out, I call and I got him. And that's mm -hmm. how I knew. So I'm sorry, I got the order wrong. It's been a few years, but, yeah. um, but it was interesting because this became, this was one of the first big insider trading cases of modern era that sort of um, uh, sort of set new rules in place and, you know, became quite a uh, quite a sensation of the day. So that was that was really your first time being involved in something bigger than yourself, really. I mean, yeah, yeah, this was this was where I really was able to put it all together. And then there was, you know, there were stories written and books written and people I worked with, reporters I worked with, were able to interview Levine and were able to put- Were you in any of those together. books? Were you mentioned in any of those yeah, books? Yeah, I think I was men mentioned in the, I have it here somewhere in the Dennis Levine book. And I was mentioned in stories because I either, I worked with one of the reporters who wrote one of the stories or books um, I worked with. At the now Levine. admit it, when you're in your twenties and your thirties and, you, and you're in a book, that's kind of cool, right? You're just yeah, like, wow. this, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Now, now it's no I, big deal I, for you. Yeah, what's that? Now it's no big deal for you. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's it, there's so much going on. Yeah. So I uh, I uh, then after that, 
uh, you know, the market's rock, rocking and rolling. I want to make a change. I actually want to get back to Chicago. I really don't want to stay in New York. So, but the Tribune won't have me back at that point. They say you haven't been gone long enough. So I ended up then making a switch and I switched to one of my sources was an art. In those days I was talking to a lot of risk arbs and uh, one of my sources was risk, risk arbs. So I went to work for a risk arbitrage firm in 1986. And that's, that's where, again, I learned, learned, learned what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I learned, I worked at a, at a firm um, called Paddington Partners. I worked for two, two guys who were childhood friends. Uh, and it was hard. It, that was the first time I think I was sort of, you go to a situation, you had been the, the reporter, I won't, you've been, had some persona, you've been out there. And suddenly you walk into this very quiet office. You're told to sit over there. You're not really part of the, the center of it all. And you just are there all day, just sort of working. And they mm -hmm. did some activist stuff back then. It was kind of exciting because I was involved in one of the activist programs when Anchor Hawking was sold. We were big owners of Anchor Hawking. And I was able to make the calls to the directors and back in those days and say, hey, we're big owners of the stock. What are you going to do? And really get involved in the situation. I was able to put on the position. The only time I've ever had that been told to just suddenly, hey, how much do we buy? And I'm like, how much do we buy? What are you talking about? And they're talking real money. Um, and I did that, but I was always a little bit of a fish out of water there. I didn't feel quite great doing that job. I knew I was making more money and could make more money than I could as a journalist. Oh, I bet. And I'll never forget, I, get a, I got a phone call. I get a phone call from a friend who I'd worked with in Chicago, who now had moved to the San Francisco Chronicle. And he'd become the city editor. And he said, we have this new business column we've started, but I'd really, you know, the people are just starting it publisher wanted started, would you be interested in, in, in interviewing for this job? And I said, nah, this is too, the potential with this job is just too great for me to, to go back to journalism. And that was probably in, ah, maybe it was in August of 1987. Mm -hmm. Well, in October of 1987, they had this thing called the stock market. I, I heard about that. <laughs> Yeah. And I had been taking Black classes, Monday. Black Monday. I had been taking financial accounting classes at the uh, New York, then the New York Institute of Finance. And I would go there every Monday night. I think Monday, I think it was every Monday night and uh, take my classes. And um, things were getting kind of rocky in the market before that. And I remember the day of the crash, watching the partners in our firm who really, two guys who had their acts together, really, I wouldn't say they were panicking, but they were, like everybody, they were freaked out. And I remember walking down Nassau Street that day after the, you know, going to my class, there it wasn't crowded the way it used to be. People mm -hmm. were devastated. And going to the class, and the class mm -hmm. was only uh, half full. And thinking to myself, there are going to be a lot of people out of work. And I'm in a job that I'm not 100% happy doing and I went home that night and I called my friend at the San Francisco Chronicle and I said, hey, Dan, you know that job you called me about still open? And, and so and, and that I, was uh, literally on Black Monday, Black Monday. Wow. And two months later, I made some excuse that I was going to be on vacation and, and I um, flew out to uh, to San Francisco New Year's over the New Year's holiday. I think it was over New Year's, over Christmas sometime. I don't know. Went out and uh, interviewed for the job and got the job and took it, you know, made the move and made the change a few months later. Partners at the firm weren't, you know, they were not thrilled. I think I was making that change, but um, it was right for me. And I knew what I had to do because I also knew I was ready to take on a column. I knew I was at this stage of my career where I could actually try to do something and what I did when I went to San Francisco, and this is very important, this is pre-internet. This is yeah. pre-CNBC. This is a very different era. And what I knew I wanted to do was I wanted to have a proprietary column. And I wanted to do it differently 
than the typical business column in a public a, in a, in, a, in a newspaper. I wanted it to be stocky and edgy, and that's sort of what they wanted. It was in the days of mergers and acquisitions. There was speculation. Mm -hmm. Dorfman was doing it on a national scale. I think I wanted to do what he was doing on a regional scale. Mm -hmm. But you weren't just regional. You were in San Francisco. You were where things were starting to happen, where growth stocks were starting to really get, you know, that was the root of so many of them with Montgomery Securities and you know, uh, Ro you know, Robbie Stevens and all these different firms, Hamburg and Quist, everything that was happening in San Francisco, Silicon Valley was starting to move, but what it wasn't anything, anything like it is today. So I went, I sold them on this proprietary column. It's easy to sell something, you know, you have this vision in your head. And I went out and I just started doing this thing where I start talking to people and writing up, you know, doing interviewing money managers and really having a long bias and m and more of an m and type bias, a rumor bias, trying to do the rumor type stuff back then. And I- uh, And that became like a 10, year, a 10 year career for you, right? That was 10 years to the day. And yeah. it was, so I started this whole concept first of doing the edgy stuff, but I also had heard about these guys, the Feshback brothers. Uh-huh. And I yeah. and, and I heard about these guys, they shorted stocks. I'd read about them and I thought, you know, that's interesting because you could basically go out. Everybody wants to know what's going to be doing well, but how about if we go out and find out where their trouble is going to be? Right. So I called up Joe and, and his brothers and we started chatting. Now this and, is Joe um, Feshbach. Joe Feshbach, the late, the late Joe Feshbach. Yeah. The, the Feshbach brothers, as you talked about, I mean, you talk about OG. These guys are OGs of the OGs. They are the original, Back original the gangsters. Yeah. And you had you had the whole crew. They had a look who they had working for them back then. I mean, they had they had the Barton brothers. They had uh, they had Jim Carruthers. They had a whole bunch of people. Carruthers worked there. Jim Carruthers things. worked there. Who else worked there? I believe I believe so. Wow. I believe Jim worked there back in the day. I think I and I I, I mean, my memory is fading at times. Yeah. But at my advanced age. But um, I think that. Uh, uh, it was just, a, you know, now, these guys, these very interesting people. Th this is the difference between then and now. I mean, just some of the dis differences, right? Their techniques ranged from, you know, doing what you did as a reporter where you get a lead and you call a hotel or every hotel in Denver to figure out if somebody's there. They they would go through people's trash. They they would take uh, things that are shredded and put them back together. Uh, they they. They busted Barry Minkow, right? That was them, wasn't it? That uh... is, is he best? I don't know if it was them, but I it might as well have been because back then they were really, um, you know, they were the game back then. They were the guys. Yeah. And they, you know, so you'd start talking. I start talking to these people. And the thing is, being, being a journalist, the one thing people would often forget, look, when I was doing the M&A work, people thought I was on the take. So I, when I started doing this column, I had to make sure I was not investing in anything. Yeah. I was out of the market. No one, one thing I wanted was no one could accuse me of doing anything. So well, I they still, they still do. So there you go. But they still do. And they did throughout, but I yeah. put that ban on yeah. even before the, the, the Chronicle had a policy. I created my own policy because I started hearing things about me. The, the Chronicle, <laughs> the Chronicle didn't have a policy with their M and a reporters that you couldn't invest. It wasn't a policy back then. It was a different world. There was no, wow. there was no formal policy. It wasn't an M and A reporter. It was a business reporter. And I'm not. Right. I don't know what the firm policy was. It was one thing was certain. I made made it very clear back then. You know, I could own no individual stocks. You could not be involved in anything. I just tried to keep it as. You just try to keep it away from it, so you could sort of smile when people said things about you, and you right. start hearing things about yourself, and then you, you know, you start seeing how things are gonna, you know, what's real and what's not. Okay. But anyway, you talk to the short sellers and I start talking to them and, you know, you get this information and you have to go out and you have to report it. And when you're writing six columns a week, as I was, yeah. I was writing uh, five real columns. And then I was writing the sixth column, which was a uh, which was a, a, a money mailbag. It was just a QA for personal finance stuff. But you are doing all this stuff, but you still have to basically confirm the information. And most of the information is in the documents. But back then. Remember, the documents weren't as easy to get as they are today. You know, you still were, there was no Edgar system in no. 19, right. 19 no. you know, in 1980, 88, 89, 90, 91. You know, so you're relying on people to send you documents. Um, you, there was federal filings, which was a system which you could get your documents from. 
you know, things were evolving back then. And you could really own the you could own the space pre any of this stuff. And it was wonderful. You know, people would come to San Francisco for conferences and they'd see my column. And so people would want their column, the column faxed to them. Um, there was a, you know, Kramer, he always tells the story about how Jim Kramer, how he would have his Morgan Stanley broker fax him my column every morning. At some point, I wanted to create a fax service of my column, but I couldn't convince the, the Chronicle to go along with it. And as I, you know, people started calling me and I started talking to people like Cahotis and others, and I started getting a little name and, and you started hearing interesting stories. And what's interesting about it, though, of all the companies I did, I did a lot of companies, one in particular will always stand out, but of all the things I did, I can tell you that almost none of them would make the grade today to be published. Because right. the one thing that did change in the late 90s is as people were able to see what clicks, how many eyeballs were you getting? Mm. I can guarantee you that most of what I wrote didn't wouldn't have gotten many eyeballs because it was companies nobody ever heard of or cared about. Mm -hmm. And even the ones that were frauds or became frauds were never going to be big enough and were never going to be popular enough. They are now. In the vernacular of today. Yeah, there wouldn't be TV names, as I call them. Right. And, and so I think a lot of those would not have made it. And when you're writing every day and you're writing about, you know, the, the joke is I Omega every day. My, the, the people I worked with were sick of reading about I Omega. Today, you'd never, you'd never get there. And when, when clicks started to come around, it was interesting to see when I was working for, you know, I went forward to street.com and then market watch you, you, cause I made the transition from print. I was one of the first main, mainstream journalists to make that transition, transition from print to, um, to online. What was that? What was, was, that, what was your headspace like there? Did, I mean, because there were, exactly I remember, I remember that there were some real big time print reporters that were just saying bloggers online, this is a fad and this is crap. And, you know, uh, nothing's ever going to happen to print media. And two or three years later, they're bloggers. Uh, you, you said know, you were ahead of that curve. I mean, how did you see that? It wasn't bloggers back then. You didn't have bloggers. In 1998, there were no bloggers. What I saw was Jim Cramer called me. I was working by the mid 90s. I was doing. Well, what was streets. the street? I, well, what? Yeah. What happened was toward the mid 90s. My job was my six columns a week. At the same time, uh, after there had been a strike at the Chronicle, the Chronicle also owned the NBC affiliate in San Francisco, Caro and TV. I became the morning business reporter for Caro and TV. So I'd be doing that in addition to my columns. At the same time, I was writing a column for Fortune magazine and at the same monthly. And at the same time, I would do weekly, I was taping weekly radio vignettes for KCBS radio, and uh, which I would have to go in, I'd have to record, and I'd have to, in the old days of, of editing, slice with a with a with a razor blade to take yeah, the actual tape yeah. and put it together. It was nerve wracking. Anyway, I do all this stuff, and toward the end of it, I remember I'd go to do the you know the the, the Carol and stuff. I get up at two forty five in the morning, get to the studio, leave the house at four, get to the studio a little before five, be on air at six, be at the studio from six to say you know nine. I'd be running in between that just so I keep some some energy up, and then I'd work a full day from nine to to five, and then drive home. You know however long it would take. I was getting kind of tired, kind of burned out. And the internet was starting to hustle. It was starting to move. I had already had a site called Biz Insider on America Online back in the day when they were paying you for content. I shared the proceeds with Chronicle. It was a different form of, say, syndication. And I, you know, I had a, I had a producer and I had people, you know, Rev Shark, who's become a popular trading um, uh blogger, columnist at thestreet.com, and it's become a brand of his own. You know, it was somebody I had on my side. I was paying people. It was kind of interesting, but I never could make the full transition. So I saw online as something where there was potential, and um, but wasn't willing to take the full risk to go do it myself. So Jim started the street, and I remember him calling me, telling me he was going to do this. I said, boy, what are you going to do? You know, because he was running his hedge fund. I said, what are you going to do? about the elephant in the room, which is, you know, you're running a hedge fund, you're going to have a, a publication. And he said, I've already, we've already reached out to the regulators for that, which I thought was really smart. And when I started looking for a change after 10 years, is, you know, even though I had this thing going, I was looking for a change. And I con was considering there was 
the Wall Street Journal or the street. It became sort of like the Wall Street Journal was thinking of hiring me in a sort of a joint deal with CNBC or go to the street. And I sort of uh, went to see Jim and uh, clicked with him and he offered me a pretty good deal. And I decided to make the transition and that's how I made it. And I, I've always said to myself, if I didn't do this and it was successful, I would kick myself. And so I figured taking the risk, what what's the worst that could happen? And the worst is that happened that I think in retrospect, the only thing I wouldn't do again is I wish I hadn't moved to New York because I could have stayed in San Francisco. The move was very hard on my family. Um, but and you were I there for a New while. Was, well, no, I was in New York for about two years, two and a half years. We've done I've gone back and forth. I've moved coast. I've done three coast to coast trips in my life where I've gone back and forth, back and forth, you know, where we've lived there. Trips, you mean lived, moves. Lived here. Yeah, we've done three cross-country moves. Oh, and, wow. And when I lived there last time, uh, or the, the, that time, um, the one thing I did do is I'd go into CNBC early in the morning for free, and I'd be on TV as a contributor for free. And, you know, I was just building my brand. Then we, we had a show on Fox with Jim, me, Adam Lashinsky, Brenda, Brenda Butner, Gary B. Smith, and we were in the early days of Fox. We had it was called the street.com on Fox. It was a weekend show. Did it for a year until things imploded with that. And um, How'd instead they of going to Fox, I stayed with the street. How they implode? Uh, implode? What did that mean? There was Jim, Jim had a, uh, I think Jim and Roger Ailes had some words. Really? Uh, so yeah, <laughs> something along those Good lines. Good for Jim. So yeah. So, so the thing is, I believe that there was more to this online thing. And it was really the right, it was one of those right moves at the right time. And uh, I just moved with it. And then I was with the street for, I think, six years. And then I had a, there was a change in editors. I new editor and I didn't get along. He, we had a little bit of a dispute. So I went across the street to Market Watch and spent time at Market Watch. And uh, those were phenomenal people at Market Watch. And uh, then went into the research business. Uh, with an, another partner, uh, Debbie Merritt's, uh, back in the 2008 period, right before things <laughs> fell apart. Yeah. My timing became bad. Yeah. And then um, we had a business for a few years, and, and uh, I wanted to go back to journalism. She wanted to go do a hedge fund thing, and I, I really wanted to do the CNBC thing real time. So I went to CNBC you know, full time, moved back to the East Coast, and I went there for one contract, which was three years, and we wanted to get back to California. And here we are. So your contract for CNBC what, was started in 2008 or nine? No, no, no. 2010. 2010. And I was there for, so Debbie and I were in business for two years. And then um, uh, I went to do the CNBC thing. It was, uh, they would have continued with me for another three years. I was a little concerned because of my age, because after that contract, I'd be getting closer to re retirement age. And I was worried that my future would be out of my control. Um, I was doing well, I think, at CNBC, uh, but I, yeah, think I think I so plateaued too. there. But I think I plateaued. It's really hard doing what I did. And um, I really wanted to control my career. So I went to this back. I created a newsletter with the street, which was an absolute disaster. Absolutely failed. It was a short bias newsletter. Um uh, which just did not do well. And, and I refused to do some of the newslettery type things. I refused to go out and say the 10 stocks to short. I sort of put blocks on that. And that was not, you know, that didn't go over well. And then I decided, let's try this research business. And here I am doing this research business. And with Don for the past six years, Don and, Vickery. Uh, Don Vickery. And yeah. yeah. And so we've been doing that. And um, chugging well, along. before we get to Pacific Square, and, and I've read your research. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, it, it's great. And We'll talk about that more, but there's mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, I think, you know, I'm interested in hearing about how short sellers got their information out there or catalyzed their research kind of prior to the Internet or as the Internet was kind of a burgeoning thing. Like, I mean, there was an AOL thing um, that, that happened in the late 90s and you had a couple of frauds. You blew up. I mean, you dropped some bombs. Yeah. Uh, Airmasoft. Uh, Rimasoft. And, yeah, Rimasoft. Rimasoft. Yeah. So a Rimasoft, and uh, that's not your only one. You had a couple, a couple of the, the most favorite one. I mean, there were, look, the, the way things worked back then, and this is why I think activist and activist investors like you and, and Carson and many others became is because back then 
there were a few journalists who short sellers would talk to. Yeah. Uh, possibly because we understood it, because we um, we did our work. It's it's a huge problem today when I talk to a reporter who's a business reporter. And doesn't and know accounting? Accounting. They don't know business. It's tough. You don't have to know accounting. You don't yeah. have to know it. I knew nothing. I, blew, I learned everything as I went. I would take, I'd be working on a, a report. I would be working on a story and I'd be pulling, whether it was Howard Schillett's book off or some book, I, you know, uh, um, uh, Charles Mulford's books. He's a, an accounting professor in, in Atlanta. I, I would get stuck on something mm -hmm. and try to teach myself as I went. And I'd forget half of it after I did it. But just to know, I always felt it's important to be able to um, know what you're writing and understand or to the best of your knowledge what you're writing. And if it's too too complicated, just sort of like work around that. Um, so back then, whether it was talking to me or some folks at Barron's, um, you know, John Lang, Bill Alpert, other people like yep, that. Bill Alpert. There were, you know, different, you know, USA Today, there would be some Roddy Boyd. Were different reporters. Yeah, Roddy was Roddy was at the post. Yeah. Where was Roddy before the post? So he came a little later. Roddy was a little later in the scheme of things, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so, but he was there. We were all doing different things, variations on a theme. I was doing my own thing regionally uh for a number of those years. And back in the in the if you go back, but I have to tell you, if you go it really was before the early 2000s, because if you go back to the early 1990s, yeah, that's where it really was starting to kick into high gear. Before the early 1990s, Dorfman had that to himself. Right. He pretty much, Dan Dorfman, you know, was at the Wall Street Journal where he did it um, in the Hurt on the Street column. And then he went to USA Today and, you know, he was at Dow Jones Newswire. He had a lot of that. And then, Every investor wanted his ear, short or long. Everyone wanted his ear. So... Then I came and did it my way. We all did it our ways. And um, and I I mean, one of the best stories I had, because a lot of these were really in the, um, the 1990s, the very best story I had, without question. The one that it will always be, everybody has one, will be a company called Media Vision. Mm -hmm. And Media Vision was a sound card company that was the is, is back in the early 90s. Montgomery took it public, Montgomery Securities. And there had already been a company taken public, probably by Robbie Stevens, I forget by whom, but it was called Creative Labs, Creative Laboratories. And so you always had the follow on offering, right? So the, the company that didn't get out was the second one and it was going to be a little more aggressive. And we went out and I had a situation where, you know, you got the tips, the original tips came from the short sellers. But this is classic what the activist investors see today or the activist, uh, you know, researchers and people like that see today. I would be public on a story like that. And I would go out and always, was, I always call this, you know, deconstructing, reconstructing. That's mm -hmm. what I did as a journalist is yeah. someone would come to you and share information, but now you have to vet the information. Right. And what was difficult about media vision is that the CEO was a source of mine. Oh, he was a source of mine when we talked about companies like creative labs oh. and he was a chatty guy and yeah. I liked him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hard when you start hearing things um, about, about a, someone you now may have to call up and say, Hey, did you really do this? And I kind of ignored it for a while, but then I was talking to the analyst from, I think he was Robbie Stevens, who told me he was in the CEO's office and the CEO is making an appointment to have the wax, to have the, the hair taken off his back with wax, to have his back wax. Uh, he's guilty of something. And I, I said, there's a story here. Yeah. There's a story here. Yeah. So I, with that, I started to look into and get more serious about the company. And the CEO obviously started getting angry with me. Now, remember, I'm publishing on the front of the business section of the San Francisco Chronicle every day. Yeah. And I could come out every day writing about this stuff. Right. Yeah. Or writing about this company, Media Vision. Right. And writing about it. Bad move on his part to piss you off. Well, I started writing about it. And um, it's interesting because once I wrote about it, I'll never forget the stock went up the day I wrote about it. He called me up and he said, aha, your short seller friends are wrong. The stock is going up. I hope they go home and beat their wives. That's really oh. what he said. 
Wow. And, and I said, and I thought to myself, wow. no, the, the stock is going up because the stock is going up. It means nothing else. And what happened was, as I, the more I wrote about it, the more people came out of the woods, yep. which is something yep. that it was so important. But I have to tell you, being the cautious guy I am, I was always nervous. Mm -hmm. I'm a nervous guy. I was always nervous that someone was going to try to dupe me. Mm -hmm. So one guy called me and claimed he had documents. And he had, this guy had said, former employee of the company, he had been fired, but he had documents. Mm. And he was one of those guys who's a young guy, they're taking me down, yeah. I'm gonna take them down. And he comes to my office and I'm nervous. He's got a gun. So we have a, there's a glass walled conference room in the reception area. I right. said to everybody, I'm going to meet this guy. I don't yeah. know what's going to happen. Yeah. So I said, I said, uh, let's um, just know where I am, know what's going on. He comes in, he gives me the documents. These are amazing documents. But of course, you have to worry. They're being doc doctored. I'm worried that's kind of situation where, the, where he's being set up to give it to me. So this is stuff you have to think about. Is he giving it to me so I'll publish it and then he can sue me, then the CEO can sue me for libel. How do you determine this, right? And what he gave me basically yeah. was information that showed it was information from the actual company. I was able to piece through to show that the dot that the revenue they were recognizing mm -hmm. was being recognized on products mm -hmm. that hadn't yet been manufactured because the products were still on a boat that was coming from China. And that was the crux of the story. And it was wonderful information. And when I talked to him after I published, I was able to confirm the information. I was able to piece it together. It was real, yeah. and we published well, it. And then all I think sorts that, of I think that's legal now. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think a lot of companies do that now. You know, once you yeah. place the order, they book the revenue. I mean, it's uh, geez. They, there was no, there was nothing booked on these. These were, these were, these were. They were recognizing the revenue before the products were. There was, there was nothing. There were no orders for the products. They were, they were ah. trying to create the orders. This was a company where the CEO was famously known to. On the last day of they the were recognizing order. revenue on on sitting inventory. There, are, no, there was no sitting inventory. There was no inventory. Wow. So the CEO was famous for, at the end of the quarter, helping load the tractors, mm -hmm. closing the door on the back of the truck, hitting it, saying, "There you go, shipped." As it went to the other side of the parking lot, and that's that kind of stuff was going on all the time. And while some wow. people may say that's appropriate, we all know that's no very aggressive. So anyway, those kind of things. So that's how it worked back then. And that's what I was able to do. And I was able to create a career doing that or keep my career going doing that and evolve my career. And into the 2000s, it continued with different stories like Arimasoft, where, uh, which was a multi-country story. Yeah. Um, which, but again, a company that might not make the grade today for people to pay attention. I mean, I can tell you that when I was writing a lot about overstock.com back in the day, when I could actually see the eyeballs that clicked on the overstock stories, it was a very controversial story, CEO oh, Patrick yeah. Byrne and the, all that stuff. They had some of the lowest eyeball counts. Really? They were surprisingly low. Again, teaching me that some of these things where the short sellers would get very caught into their world of their own little universe, yeah. Outside of that, sometimes there was a, you know, and that's why some of these stories don't make it today. And I think that's why a lot of these stories will never see the day, their day in print because no one's going to read them or there's not going to be enough people to read them for somebody to point to the reporter to say, what are you spending your time on this for? Yeah. When there's something out there that's far more important and compelling. I don't think the overstock story as, I mean, rich as it is, complete with the, you know, the, the, the Sith Lord it was controlling right. all the uh, all the short sellers and uh, and Patrick Byrne on an open conference call, just mid sentence explaining that he's not on cocaine. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a great throwaway line for uh, investors. It's important to know that, though. Uh, well, yeah, it, it is important to know, but I don't think that could happen today because at that point. There was much more skepticism towards critical research than there is now. Uh, and and critics were not taken as seriously. There really wasn't a Carson Block. I know there was 
Andrew Left was probably the first one that was kind of really publishing this stuff and and taking the taking the lawsuits. Yeah. And he probably could have got some eyeballs on this. But I mean, this guy got away, Patrick Byrne, with suing everybody. And how long did that did that last? Like five years? You were involved in that lawsuit, weren't you? I was one of the front and center people. I was I was not sued by him. I was um, but through him, I believe, is was I think it's as a result of him that the SEC came and, you know, uh, subpoenaed me, Jim Cramer and Carol Mond, who was then at uh, Dow Jones. And uh, we received these subpoenas when Chris Cox, the head of the SEC, was in the hospital. Yeah. And it was all done the way it wasn't supposed to have been. And you were you were a reporter press. at that point. You weren't a researcher. You you were reporter. you were a reporter, strictly uninvested in any of it. And the SEC basically sends you a letter saying produce all of your sources and your documents, which is pretty unheard of. You I mean, it's a pretty it's serious thing that's got to happen. And they got a lot of blowback. And eventually the boss got out of the hospital. Yeah, well, well, he got out of the hospital and they and I'll tell you, Jim and I went on Jim's show. I was working for Dow Jones at the time and uh, we had a phenomenal uh, libel lawyer uh, there. And um, and I went on Jim's show that night and Jim on the show famously on Mad Money, he uh, he ripped up the subpoena on live TV, which just yeah. classic Jim. And it got everybody all, you know, all, uh, you know, people were saying, how could he do that? It's so disrespectful. But the fact is what the SEC did and the way they did it was also disrespectful. Yeah. And it, it basically was trying to ram something through that obviously backfired on them. And um, but the SEC, you've got to understand if you're dealing with short sellers, people always think you're on the take. And back even in the 90s with the with the fetchbacks, I'll never forget. I was walking out. I think I told you the story on the phone the other day. I was walking out of a restaurant in San Francisco and in Union Square. And I saw the head of the SEC sitting at the bar and, you know, he's having his lunch. And I said, hey, Gladwin, how you do? And he says, hey, I got to talk to you. Here's some stuff about you and the fishbacks. Yeah. He always call them the fishbacks. I said, yeah. Well, okay. whatever, you know, call me, calls me with a lawyer on the phone and they're sort of trying to make the kind of allegations that I'm in bed with guys doing something that I shouldn't be doing. Yeah. So I ended up thinking about it. You know, he said, you'll be hearing back from us. I said, well, you have to talk to our attorneys or whatever. Chronicle said, just write a column about it. Mm -hmm. So Chronicle being the edgy place it was, I wrote a column about this guy. Exactly what I told you, what happened coming out with the fish backs and all this stuff. Yeah. Never heard from him again. Yeah. Um, but they always think everyone always thought that everyone thinks the journalists were on the take. And while there were a few bad apples out there, yeah, just doing your job. And if you can deconstruct it and reconstruct it, it's it's yours to have. It, that's exactly right. And and circling back to the subpoena you got from the SEC, they eventually backed off. Chris Cox, you know, said, yeah, it went away. Know, yeah, uh, I was in the hospital uh, mistake. They made a mistake. They didn't check with me. Forget about it. Uh, but yeah, it's a tough spot that they're in. And people have said to me before, you know, it, it must be great for you when you go meet with the SEC on Longway Petroleum or l and Energy or whatever, where you have these, this video and empirical evidence that's just perfectly does their job for them, that puts the case together for them. That must be a great day for the SEC. And I say, no, that's a good day. A great day is when I've done all of that and I've made a mistake too, and they get two cases for one. Because nobody on the other side of the table gets a pass. Everybody has to do their job and do it honestly. You can be both guilty in their eyes. And I think that's the way it should be. But you always have to be on your guard uh, with them. And I think that's a good thing, actually. Yeah. I mean, thankfully, I've never been um, on that side of it. And uh, well, you were like almost there that way. <laughs> almost there. Hey, look, yeah. let me tell you something with, with Arimasoft, which was a company you were talking about. Yeah. They and that was an interesting situation because that company, if I'm remembering the companies right, because there's a blur on some of them. They had the CEO in London, the CFO in L.A. and the chairman in Greece. Anyway, that's always a sign for mm -hmm. that's always a potential problem. Um, but I think that uh, that's a case where they they were going to sue me. They actually were going to file a lawsuit. They filed a lawsuit that was delivered. It was, I was working uh, at the street, I think, at the time. But what's interesting is the, the day of or the day after the lawsuit, which was filed against me, some hedge funds, et cetera, et cetera, the SEC swooped in and literally raided them and 
they just ended up all the fraud that was alleged was proven to be the case. Well, that worked out. That, that must that have been nice. Work out. Yeah. So you met some real characters in your time. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the short selling side, and we do have a few of those listeners. I mean, you're talking Mark Ahotis in the early mm -hmm. days, David Rocker, mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I guess Andrew left probably in the early days too, right? Andrew was not, Andrew wasn't really a source at the time because he was doing other things. Maybe I, I don't remember exactly when he started out, um, doing his thing. Uh, we started out with a site called stock lemons. Yeah. Stock lemon. It was yeah, good. Yeah. Stock lemon. Yeah. yeah. It was he's, er he's er early two thousands. Uh, and, and, the, and you had the feshbacks and, you know, these guys would just basically they to get out their research, they would call you and try to get you interested in it. And mm -hmm. you would do like Bill Alpert or Roddy or whatever, what you're saying you're doing. You take it in and you have to recreate it yourself or it doesn't exist. That's it. No. And there were, the, you know, the guys at Kingsford, um, you know, Mike Michael Wilkins, Dave yep. Shally. you know, there are a lot of different people out there. But I think what you what you had to do is look, people would say they're using you. They're right. They're using me. And I well, was using you're, Yeah, you're using us too. I'm trying to get information. Yeah. They're trying to get it out. And yeah. But here's the thing. Look, I always said, show it to me in the documents. Mm -hmm. So if it's publicly, when you're, especially when you're doing day to day, a lot of these are items. They're small things mm -hmm. that might lead to something bigger. But right. most of them are small things. They're incrementally additive mm -hmm. to the entire story. Right. It's something that is important to see. But there are plenty of times a short seller would say, Hey, look at that change back in the day when it mattered when there was a change in an SEC filing, yeah. a change in a risk factor. Yeah. You'd say, look at that change in that risk factor. And then you'd go and you'd do the research and you'd find out, no, wait a second. That's not a change. They just moved it. And the right. red lining didn't catch that that was moved. You just saw that it wasn't there anymore. Because, you know, when you're doing red lining or you're going through a red line document, you really have to be, especially back then, it was a little harder but yeah. you really have to make sure that it just hasn't been, you know, you have programs that could else. do it for you today and for a long time, but not back then. No, so I guess you right. probably had kind of a, a hierarchy uh, in your mind of the people that called you that you could, okay, this is something huh. I'll spend my time looking into, or I don't know this person, this person has been wrong in the past. And I don't know if I'm going to waste my time. Dan, you're very good. Oh. <laughs> you have, you, you had, you exactly, you're very perceptive. You have the core of the people you enjoy talking to. There are some people you just enjoy talking to. There, yeah. There's a connection. Right. That will always be the case. No, I don't care what anyone says, who, whoever they are. Yeah. We all have people we like talking to. Right. And then there's the, so there's the core of people you talk to and they, that do, some of them might even do a better job of telling stories. So I'll right. always say. That matters a lot. Well, you get somebody like like a like a Cahotis. Yeah, he's a great storyteller. He is the best storyteller of, of all the people I talk to. Mm -hmm. He probably was the best at telling a story and synthesizing it to the point that at least there was a hook there. Now you had to mm -hmm. get beyond the hook, mm -hmm. but he was very good at that. Some people tell stories that start in the middle. And when it starts in the middle, I only have so much time. You know, yeah. we're all busy. So you had your core, then you had the other people, then you had the, the third ring, and right. then you had the people that would come in that you'd never heard of. And this was where the interesting thing would come in. So you've got all this stuff going on. I got these piles of papers on my desk. I had all these papers. Yeah. And often somebody would, would come in with an interesting idea that would just take more time for me to get to. And I put it over here because I didn't have time. And then you'd wait it out. You'd wait it out and maybe the thing would happen and you'd go, oh my gosh, I wish I had talked to that person. It's like an investor, right? The ideas you missed. Because I know what you, you mean, I do. Mm -hmm. And then and then that person now has credibility with me. Yeah. Now I pull that, now I'm calling that person every week saying, what do you got, what do you got, what do you got? But I'll tell you one interesting one that I missed that I like at what? Chanos calls me, Jim Chanos calls me one day. I've heard of him. And we're talking, he's a, he's a short story. You've heard yeah, of him? yeah. And he calls me, he tells me about Enron. Yeah. And he tells me about Enron and I'm busy and it's calm. What he's talking about is complicated. And my brain doesn't synthesize mm -hmm. complicated very well. It takes time for me to think about it. Mm -hmm. And I put it over here on the side where there's a little bit of dust. Mm -hmm. And about three, four weeks later, I take a look at it and really start thinking about it. And I think it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Call him up. You know that Enron you talked to me about? Says, I'm sorry, I'm I'm already talking to somebody else about it. In comes Bethany McLean. There goes Bethany. 
hats off to Bethany and, 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 um, yeah. And yeah. And that could have been you. You could have been Bethany. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be. Be- There's one Bethany McLean. Yeah. She's yeah. thankfully, I think the, the, the reality is if you want to think about how the universe works, yeah, it went to Bethany because she probably did a substantially better job than I would have been able to do. Well, that's, that's very humble of you. And, uh, and look, as it turned out, she did a great job and you did a great job on some other things. But did you, when, when Chanos called you, he really wasn't Jim Chanos back then either, right? I mean, oh, like, he was Jim Chanos back then. He was, he, I met Jim at a, I met Jim at a Montgomery Securities Conference back in the early days before Montgomery banned me from attending those conferences. Oh. Um, and I was banned from attending those conferences. I've been there too. <laughs> I, it turns out I can't get into a Roth conference. Oh, you can't get into it. Neither can I. So <laughs> we'll get bowling shirts. <laughs> I actually was. I went to a Roth conference out of that while ago. Not about. No, it was actually now about seven years ago, and um, and it was hard to get me. I when I was working at the street, I went there for marketing purposes, and it was hard for the the CEO of the company to get them to admit me because they were so because of my reputation. Um, Byron Roth but, would, couldn't get them to to admit you they, they didn't want they did not want me there because of who i was i had free reign i went there i ended up going and i had a great time i met yeah. dusty Rhodes. but it's it's a um oh they're great conferences a, they're a lot of fun yeah there was but but it was they didn't want me there yeah um but jim when i met jim he was talking about uh i think he was talking about first executive back in the time it was an insurance company uh-huh. uh and i was first talking to him back then and it was uh so i sort of started i knew him and i would knew who he was because he was famous from his reputation with baldwin united and um again i was trying to know who the short sellers were at uh-huh. that point in time and was trying to get up to speed on everybody and he, his first executive call was a very good one it was dealing with a ceo his name was fred Carr. i think it was fred Carr, and um he was uh he was he had already building his reputation out and uh was a good person to chat with but really exploded on enron i mean that you have yeah, to say enron was the big thing but he was yeah. someone before that okay and you know he knew other people i knew and it was just one of those things yes 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 yeah well that's that is really cool so you know out of all the sources who are now short sellers or whatever, who's the biggest uh-huh. character that you met? They're all characters because they? They, sell, they, they short sell. The people who are genuine short sellers um, all suffer the same genetic malady. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 they're, and the journalists, the journalists that sort of have sort of talked to them over the years. I, I mean, I said, look, I sit back and I wonder, I used to, I used to say to, to one of them, I, I learned a long time ago when you call a short seller, you don't call them and say, hey, how you doing? You just say, hi, mm. because you never ask, how are you doing? And I remember talking to uh, to uh, uh, Dave Shally, who was a very, very good guy uh, at Kingsford. And sometimes I'd say to him, I'd say, why do you do this for a living? I mean, you're smart enough to not have to beat your head against the wall. Because I see these people beating their heads against the wall. They're right on the, they're right on the facts. But they're fighting. They were fighting the inertia of the market both companies. Yeah, the market and the too. market and the investors. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's a hard game to live. And I think it. I think it. Beca- I think it creates a level of dysfunction, and you have to live with dysfunction when you're doing that for a living. And I think that it's very that takes a toll on people. It can take a toll on people when you're right. There's nothing better than being right. Now, I, again, I'm removed. I'm not the guy who has the money. Well, there there the is something better than being right. There definitely is. There's being right and the rest of the market agrees with you is better. That's what I meant. Yeah, when you're right and it's proven to be right, that's a great that's a that is a great day. Yeah, and, and, and hopefully and hopefully you're still invested by then and not squeezed out. Well, the problem with the market is I've often tweeted it is um, you know, it's just so humbling. And anyone who mm-hmm. has great hubris finds a way of being humbled. And 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 that's the reality of the market. If you're and in it I don't long care enough. who you are, I don't care if you're if you're a participant like you are, if you're an investor. Or if you're a researcher slash journalist as I am, you have the same feelings and you still want to be right. No one wants to be wrong. And it's the difference between an investor and, and a journalist, or in my case, an, an ex-journalist, is you still have your credibility on the line. Right. You still have you, you still have the sense that you're putting all this time into work and putting it together. And you know, you want to be right. Nobody doesn't want to go through all that and then be proven wrong. But of course, there are plenty of dead ends you 
how many stories have I worked on or how many ideas have, have, have I been wrong on? Or were, have I been working on where you just couldn't get across the finish line? Right. That's also very frustrating. Well, I've got an idea about like, you know, people, I specifically my wife, when, when, when it's a big fight and, uh, and, you know, China's coming after you, your government's coming after you. She says, why does it have to be you? Why, you know, why isn't it somebody smarter? I think is what she's saying. And I can't disagree with her, but at a certain point in time, once you make that switch, because I was never a short seller, I always look at the long side and I, and I see it from the investor's perspective. The American dream is built on positivity, on belief, uh, on reliability. And you want to, you want to have all those things. And who is this person to tell me that what I believe is wrong? And it's a very difficult hurdle to get over. And you need that reputation that you have and built over a, a career obsessing over every person you spoke to that somebody's trying to get over on you. Somebody's lying to you. You've got to make sure it's right, because if you're wrong, that's your credibility. And it's the same thing with a short seller. Not so much a long investor who's writing about, you know, the, the positive things could happen in a company, because when they're wrong, they're just overly optimistic. And that's OK. Uh, and taking out the pump and dumps, obviously, those are something completely different. But when you're wrong as a business journalist or, you know, even a short seller, if I can make the comparison, you lose your reputation and you lose your currency um, going forward. And I think the reason that there are activist shorts now where there weren't maybe in the 90s, 80s and early 2000s is I don't really know of very many business reporters that are left. I mean, Bill Alpert's out there. And I think he does a fine job. Um, you know, Gretchen Morganson. I mean, like there are a few out there that are left. They're 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 left. I think you have there's there there are great business journalists out there, but they're also operating within the confines of their organizations, and they're 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 operating. Within, they're working for lawyers. You know, That's it. They're, it's all tortious interference bullshit. No 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 no. Remember what I said. It's about today. Remember, newsrooms have been shrunk down. You yeah. don't have the same, um, you know, puffery out there to go after. When I say puffery, let me rephrase that. The same extra bodies out there to right. do the different little stories, perhaps, that might work. There's limited amount of people doing, you know, doing the work, less people than there were, fewer people than there were. And I think that as a result of that, it just creates, you know, there's a, there's a different type of a story they're going to go after and they're going to spend time on. But the lack of bandwidth that's put on critical research of companies uh, at yeah. the at the at the newspaper level or at the big media level has created a vacuum uh, that that we fill along that that could be filled by investment bank analysts in my opinion, but is not. <laughs> no, it can't be because investment bank analysts do too much. I tell you, if you are if you're covering more than ten companies, yeah, and even ten companies, yeah. you know, we do eight to eight to twelve or whatever. It's a push to really keep up on them and to really know them and to really every quarter really want to do a significant review of the numbers. Remember, an analyst, at an investment banking firm can has to they put out the on an earnings come out. They put out something right away. And then the next day they put out maybe their junior analyst or the, the senior. Who knows? They put out something else. It's done. It can take us on certain companies two, three, four days or Don to go through the numbers forensically, Linda to go through the numbers fundamentally, me, Linda and Don to all go through. But the, my, you know, her, my, my, my point, altogether. my point is that what they do should be so important that if it took a couple extra days to be right and to be fluid and to be street accurate, wants. that, yeah, the street doesn't want it. They don't, they, they want nine, nine and a half out of 10, uh, buy recommendations to a sell. And that's what we've continually got from them. And it's really not a business anymore. It really isn't that that gives like I re, I'm reading your research back to Pacific Square, what you're doing now. And they look a lot like maybe more than mine or, or, or some of the other short sellers out there. They look a lot like an analyst, an investment bank analyst report, except there's so much rich detail and there's so much more accurate. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, why can't 
every investment bank analyst report be this detailed and this accurate. Why? Well, remember, let's let's give them the benefit of let's give them their due on industries and on broader reports. Um, the sell side analysts have been typically do a very good job. They they can give you an overview if because that's where they spend their time. They'll spend their time on a 50 page initiation where you can find a nugget um, or on an industry on a full industry. If you really mm -hmm. want to get the lowdown, they'll, they can do some very good work on that. But that's not making a call. That's basically, yeah. That's doing re just yeah. straight research yeah. on something. And I think where you, where I would take, look, there are analysts out there who have made some very gutsy calls and who have been uh, very contrarian. They're willing to put a sell on it. You know them, I know them, and they've taken a lot of heat for it. And sometimes I'll see an analyst who or I lost their job. On. Well, they've lost, some have lost their jobs, but sometimes when they're right. So I've talked to analysts over time who put sales on stocks and then they're proven to be right. Mm -hmm. So I call them and I say, man, your phone must be ringing off the hook. No. People must be congratulating you and saying they wish they had paid attention to you. And you know what they say? They say, no, no. you're not. We're, we're not, we're not going to get that banking business. Well, oh, are you talking about like from, from the investor community that would be congratulating yeah, their clients? Uh, okay. Their well, clients. Okay, fair enough. But like, none of them are really on Twitter or have a public persona where some do, some do. I know one in particular. Go look yeah. at Michael Pactor. Michael Pactor has been one of the sort of most contrarian guys out there, and he's you know he was the. I'm, I'm thinking for the most against, part, you know, like I mean, I'll, I'll, almost every company that that I'm looking at, you're like, I'm who's the analyst? Okay, let's go ahead and read the research. Yeah. Fine, just just so we say we've read everything. Uh, we very rarely get anything out of it. And you go look for their public persona, it doesn't exist. You don't know. Well, it probably doesn't because their compliance departments are yes. basically saying, you're not getting anywhere near that, at least with your name. Who knows who's doing what private? Right. They're anonymous, which is ironic, right, on Twitter. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, look, I just, I just think that whole investment banking side, you know, being detached from the analyst is complete BS. And that they're going to lose the business. And this is... This is what's broken in that model. Uh, if this is what's so amazing, Dan, yeah, is that all these years, think about it. You know how many years, how many decades we've yeah. been having this discussion? I know. And nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. The last time I heard that there was going to be any kind of substantive change was was after the crash in 2008. People were like, you know what? This is BS, man. Like, you know, over nine out of 10 buys to sells, something's got to change and, and nothing changed. And the best clients do get more information. Let's face it. That's that's the way it goes. There's that whisper line uh, that's existed, you know, ever since you've been writing, too. But if you want to you want to talk about how to fix things, that's one way of doing it. Um, I don't know that it will. Therefore, I will still have a job. Uh, and so will you. So looking at Pacific Square, I, you know, I was reading over your research. Like I said, it was, it, it's great stuff. And you're doing like 10 companies a year. We try to do, we try to do, we say we'll do eight to 15. The reality is if we do 10 or 11, depends on the year, depends on the type of name, depends on how much work is involved. Each, each piece takes a lot out of you, as you know, from doing what you do. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we publish weekly, but we, for big calls, big, big calls, or the, what we consider big calls. Other than this year, this year has been, you know, an embarrassment. Um, when I say an embarrassment, I, I actually. I don't know about that. I mean, like, it's, well, it's, it's gone actually, against you. I'm, I look at your track record for the last five years since you've been doing this, and you, you got a winning track record over the last five mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Um, there's There are much more, many more wins than, than losses, and a few pushes in there. Uh, so doing that on the short side, and really this is a five-year bull run. I mean, it's been 10, but you're doing it into a bull market is my point. Have you ever thought about, you know, you know dipping a toe into the activist short pond? I mean, you've got a name, a pretty big one, and uh, yeah, I'm reading your reports, and the, they're, they're less – salacious than most short seller reports that I've read, which I think is very refreshing. Actually, it's more to the heart of the problem than counting how many times you can say the word fraud in the first paragraph. Uh, 
And I think there's a there's a spot for that. Leader, you won't you won't see us say, you won't see us say fraud in the first, second, third, or tenth paragraph. Probably not. Um, I yeah. I mean, I think I think if you found one, you might. Well, I don't know. You know, it depends what the what the libel attorneys would say. I thought it was very interesting. You had this uh, this this very good podcast. This. Two hours with Soren. Um, I do not know him. I'd like to know him. Good guy. Uh, and he he made these comments. It was a very lucid interview, and he made these comments about the salaciousness versus the non salaciousness. And I know I've had specific conversations with with Carson Block about this. Why there has to be salaciousness? Why there doesn't? You know, why you have to be bombastic versus not being bombastic? Uh-huh. Have I ever thought? I thought about it. Um, I don't think. I know, I don't know, I don't know. You know, we've never really discussed it with anyone. I don't know who the players are in that market. Uh, Everyone does it a little differently. Uh Um, You know, sometimes you wonder if your names were catalyzed, if if they're actually people would pay attention because sometimes you see these these names we do and you do these really good work. Mm -hmm. You know it's good because when you think about how we operate, you have the right, we're a right brain, left brain type of a firm. So Mm -hmm. you have... The forensic in my business partner, Don Vickery, right. who co-founded Grading Analytics, and I think is really one of the forensic geniuses out there. His brain is sort of wired that way. He's got artificial intelligence. It, it, it operates like that. He's not an excitable guy. He he thinks the things his way and he sees it. He sees it the way many people can't see it. And our, our analyst, Linda, who used to run, run for 20 years, was a short biased manager or a co-manager of a fund and is more of a fundamental analyst. And then you have me as the writer and the doing research when there's research to be done that we actually pick up the phone and make a call, um, make calls. And I write the stuff. So it's in my voice. And then we all go through it and hash it out. And we're always amazed when we do this thing, the three of us, we say, I sometimes say, how does one person do this? Because it's so hard and we're finding, you know, Linda will question Don's numbers and he'll see something that he doesn't see. And on the 10th read through, we'll all find stuff that doesn't make sense. But would we do activist work? You know, part of me misses being out there. Mm-hmm. Part of me likes not being out there. Uh-huh. Um, y- you know, I liked busting companies when I could. I like being part of the process. And I think I do it as well as any. But but then, yeah. Dan, I think about how, you know, I think about the ones I didn't get right. Um, I always think about that. Well, good. Yeah, that's I healthy. Think about it, uh, it, but it, I don't know. It's healthy. It keeps you honest. Keeps you on your toes. And I mean, look, I, you know, I don't know what you mean necessarily by "I didn't get right." Um, you know, there, it, you're in a no-win situation, right? Because, you know, if if everything you say is is, you know, right and accurate and it's great research, and the stock goes up, well, then I guess you got it wrong, right? Uh, and if if you do all that and the stock goes down day one uh, and goes back up the next day, you got it wrong. And there's all kinds of reasons where people tell you you got it wrong. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the way you look at your research right now is the way you would look at it if you were an activist short. You know, did I put the best good faith effort I have into this? Did I write everything down? Everything that I wrote down, did I believe it to be 100% true? And and then let the chips fall where it may. Whatever anybody else believes, right. at some point you've got to just set it down. Well, and I think that's the key thing. When we do our work, do we think we're right? We always think we're right or right. we think we're on the trail of something. I think that, um, that, you know, there are different ways people interpret numbers and sometimes you're just early. And, you know, obviously yeah. some people view that as wrong. We don't make trading calls. So when we do our work, we put it out when we think there's something good and we think there's a decline possibility of at least 30 percent and over 12 months. That's the way we think. And we're wired. And then, you know, we're not we're not looking for frauds. You stumble on frauds. Right. Uh, and we don't go after battlegrounds. We don't go after a name. Somebody will come to us and say, why aren't you doing Tesla? And we'll say, why? Why would we waste our time on Tesla? What can we you add? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> add yeah, right. So people would ask me the same you thing. Can't. Why aren't you in the Tesla track? What what am I going to add that Chanos hasn't put in there? There's there's nothing. Once it's out in the public domain, we see it as a as something unless you can advance it right. and you want to continue fighting the battle. I like getting in there and outing things that people don't know about, even if right. it's a legitimate company. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about something that people just 
uh, missed. Right. And, and, and again, you, you know, you look at a company, let's, let's talk about a company like Mohawk, which we, yeah, good which report is the most boring wrote. company known to mankind. What's that? It was a good report you wrote on it. It was very, very accurate. Thanks. And, and, and what did it go down? Like 50%? It went down quite a bit, yes. Yeah, and yeah. it was it was interesting because it was one report we received so much pushback on because everybody wanted to own the stock. Now, this is they also we want to own it, we don't want to short it. And this is going to be this is a classic company that is where the company has made so much money for people over the years. They really wanted to believe in management. And they they met, this was one of those safe stocks that sat on a shelf and people stopped researching inside the fund and they missed a major change going on inside the industry and the company missed it. The company misexecuted in a huge way. But in the process, what's fascinating, you know, we talk about we don't go after frauds. There was a very interesting class action lawsuit filed a few months ago against Mohawk alleging some things that were just if they're true, if yeah, they're true, I read that it's quite fascinating. It's yeah. quite fascinating. Right. And it shows how, if it's true, I would say, and I stress, if it's true, it would show that management or people inside the culture of the company to continue to show the results became more aggressive. And that gets into the line of what Shanos would call, or Bethany McLean actually uh, framed it with, with, with Enron, and that is legal fraud. Right. And that would be that they push things. And now you have an, a DOJ and SEC investigation of the company. And what's interesting about it, no one's written it. It's not in the public domain. All of this has happened below the radar, other than perhaps a paper in Knoxville or you know somewhere nearby where the company is um, is, is headquartered in, 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 outside of Atlanta uh, or in, in Tennessee. And you were, you were ahead of all that two years ago. Yeah, we were ahead of it pointing out just there were issues and what my partner noticed. And this is what's interesting. He noticed things in the numbers. He would never use the F word, but things that would suggest that there was something untoward going on. He could right. see it because he likes to see these low, very slow, gradual changes yeah. in certain metrics. They give they, He feels they're much more compelling than the sudden change in receivables or something like that. He likes to see something that's evolving over time. It shows the yeah. trend. And it actually shows the potential for the fraud to begin if there's, you know, the alleged fraud to begin. In this case, he could see what was going on with uh, the numbers early on. And he could see that there was there was something that would raise a big red flag for him. And when the lawsuit came out, it was like flat bells were going, right. whistles were going off. Yep. And he was able to say, well, what they're alleging was showing up in the numbers two years ago. Right. But no one's really paying attention to that. And our view is, you know, no one's writing about this. So these are the kind of names that are not getting, no one's, talk, you know, they're not exciting. They're not sexy. Right. And that's, that's kind of an interesting situation. Now the stock went down 50% and since it's obviously recovered with home, home building stocks uh, for the right reason. But we'll see what happens with the regulatory action and, and where it ends up. Well, that's, that is, that's some interesting stuff. And if people want to subscribe to your research, it's Pacific Square, and they can maybe reach out to you and become a, uh, a subscriber. We always are interested in subscribers. It's 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 the nature of the beast of what we do. But you are a little picky about who they are too, though. You you don't just let anybody subscribe either. No, we don't. We yeah. have we're very we have a fairly limited pool of subscribers, yeah. and it's uh, it's it just you you want the right fit because right. we do things a little. I think differently than other folks. And, you know, you're just trying to, 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 in the end, help people either avoid losing money or in theoretically making money. Um, that's what we do on a good day. All right. So Herb, tell us what's your, what's your prediction just to take us out here of 2021. Uh, what does it look like for you as you're moving into 2021? I'm not going to hold you down to any kind of, you know, what percent up, what percent right. down or, whatever, but what is a macro outlook? I, I don't think you can have, look, the macro outlook is, uh, we don't do macro outlooks. I can only guess like the next person out there. Uh, and everyone I talk to who supposedly is smart is as confused as I am and you are about my, what might happen. What I do think though, just pulling it in a little bit to a micro, a little more micro is that, the excesses are, are occurring and you're seeing managements now 
that I believe become not just complacent, but they become emboldened by their stock prices. And, you know, we always like to go to the proxy to see what the motive is, because that's the motive in the proxy. If you can check it out and find where the, where the, uh, what the bonus structure is or whatever they're guided by. And right, right now, management's, they're going to have to somehow try to justify the prices of their stock. And investors are currently giving them a long lead time yeah. and cutting them a lot of slack. But you all know how, we all know how that changes and how patience wears thin. And I think there's a point where with some of these companies, patience will wear thin. And I think, you know, you only get the COVID, you know, the cover of COVID, as I now call it, for so long. Right. And companies have to start performing and stocks have certainly overshot any level of valuation, not that valuation matters now. So what do I think is going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> no. Interest rates remain low. We uh, we all know what we think might happen, but I think um, I I know what I'm worried about. What are you worried about? I'm worried that the impact of the Robin Hood crowd. Uh -huh. I I don't I don't diminish the impact, and I don't, and I I realize I've been around long enough to know that there are parts of that that may stick. What I worry about is that everybody has been pushed into the market. And right. has gone to and is now treating the brokerage accounts right. like a bank. And, re and a retirement. That's what works. And a retirement account. A retirement account. But but I'm talking about even young people who put all their monies there and it's not in a bank. I don't know what the and if it's not. Where where, where are they gonna put it, Herb? Because especially well, you're talking about young people who probably don't mm -hmm. have all that much money, right? Um or you look at the poor and disenfranchised, uh, they're not going to invest in the stock market right away, but they can't put it in a bank because it costs them money. It costs people money to have a bank account now rather than the bank paying you. I understand that. I, I understand that. But my concern is if there's a pro prolonged decline in the market. Oh, I totally prolonged agree. prolonged decline. I agree. That the the economic impact of that, not just yeah. from the decline and from everything that it reflects, but just from people losing losing the buying power that they had that helped fuel certain things, you know, during the COVID period, the surprising spending that we saw on certain things through stimulus and other things, and I and now I think people feeling emboldened that it's so easy to make money in the stock market. Oh, yeah, and you know I have to tell you one thing, Dan. We've been around long enough to know that historically when there have been periods where people didn't want to talk about shorts. And when, even when I was uh, many years ago in the early nineties, it started where people would say, I don't want to talk to you because I talked to you and you mentioned a company and the stock goes straight up because, you know, that was when the momentum was building and they would get caught up in that. And I used to get depressed about it early on. I got depressed about it. And then I realized, Oh, wait a second, this is an inflection point. Mm -hmm. And for years, those were inflection points. Yeah. The only difference now is the inflection points last a very short amount of time. Right. The, the quote CNBC markets in turmoil may not even you know may not even get to one night of them now because right. the markets could be in turmoil for a day and then it's all forgotten. But when it happens, don't ever forget how people feel when they start losing money, uh, even if it's a paper loss, even right. if it's for a few days, right. they freak out. They freak out. And if it's any longer than a few days, right. That's what I worry about. And we all saw them. We, we all remember the 99, but I don't want to make those parallels because everybody says the world is different since then. then and this since time what? Is different, so. well, is it, is it different since when? Well, the difference since 99, I would argue, is the changes since 99, I think, is the enormous impact of passive money and the ETFs and the impact, the structural impacts they've had on the market. I don't know what role that ultimately plays in all of this. I'm sure it plays a role. Um, I've talked to people who say, why would you short a stock that has that's the top five investors or the biggest passive investors out there? Because they're just going to keep it elevated until they can't. Right. Um, there's a lot of thoughts, structural thoughts in the market. And then I think the retail people on the other side, that we've seen before. But now with people buying fractional shares yeah. and people buying, uh, I mean, they're, they're just, it's just a... I, you know, I look, I, I, I hate to be the guy who criticizes everything and watch it become real. I don't, I don't know. Markets go down. Man, or, that, that's what happens. They go down. Really? Yeah. No, they I, don't go to the sky. No, they, you know, stocks, they don't don't, the sky? stocks just don't go up all the time. And I think like you know that. that aside, 
from uh, I know, yeah, I, you of all people know. Uh, that aside, I think what you touched on is so very, very true that people, 99, I mean, two, the, forget 99. They don't remember 2008, right? The, the stock's been going up since. And the kind of mental fatigue you get as a long shareholder seeing your your portfolio go down month after month, forget about day after day, but if it goes down for a couple of months, it's a big, big deal. And the knock-on effect there could be a very big deal as well. Now, I'm wondering, like, you know, are we just going to keep printing money? Because that seems to be, that seems to not matter anymore, right? $27 trillion in debt. Is that unbelievable to you? The biggest pushback I get is that what's the Fed's incentive to change this approach? Whoever does it is pulling their finger out of the dike. Yeah, well, you know what? I mean, you know, the thing about putting your finger in a dike uh, is that, like, you can't hold back that flow of water, you know, with your finger uh, forever. And eventually, it just, that pressure builds. I mean, that's the theory, right? So what is what is our money based on now? If, if anything, it's faith. That's it. It's faith in our country. It's faith in our economic system. And faith is a funny, fickle thing. When you lose it, you lose it. Uh, and that's what I worry about. When it was backed by something other than faith and some kind of cogent monetary policy, that made me feel a little better. But now it's just, you know, because we're the United States, that's why. Well, we've all seen this. I think we all know there will be a a type of an end of sorts that will rattle people. We don't know when. We don't know how. I continue to believe it will be out of left field. It will be something that um, it, because no one's going to tell, no one's going to ring the old bell. There is no bell that's rung. There will be signs, perhaps, but even then, they'll be in retrospect. Oh, I should have seen that sign. Right. Um, and 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 that's historically been the way it has been. And it and the big question is this: if and when that time comes, is it a buying opportunity or is it get the hell out? And that's going to be the other interesting thing because it's always been, you know, ever since I've been doing this, it's been the old catch a falling knife. Right. Well, guess what? No one's ever caught a falling. There's, no, there's never been a falling knife yeah. other than 99. And even then, the smart people back then figured it out and knew how to capitalize on it. So that's what I think the other thing is people will sit there and, quote unquote, buy on the dip until they can't buy on the dip anymore. Right. And I don't know how, again, I don't know how that's going to um, going to play out. I just know these are things that everyone's talking about. That means something too, right? That's that's part of an inflection point too. When everybody is talking about it, that creates a worry, a murmur in the market, and and we'll have to see. Whatever happens, happens. It's happened before. It'll happen again. We'll all be fine. And Herb, you you know you've been fantastic. I I know I took a little longer with you today than than uh, than you had planned, and I appreciate you being a great guest. All right. Well, listen, it's great talking to you. Thanks for the time. Yeah. Thanks. 